Welcome to the Key Chapters podcast on 2 Timothy chapter 2. Sometimes a person's final words in this life distill what they have learned and what they have found important and what they think the next generation needs to know. In Paul's second letter to Timothy, it's just like that. And today we're going to be looking at several key principles that Paul gave to Timothy about how to be a faithful servant of Christ Jesus. So, welcome to the Key Chapters Podcast. We're going through the Bible one chapter per day and seeing how that chapter fits into the overall message of God. Today we're looking at 2 Timothy chapter 2 and how to be a faithful servant of Christ. Now, you may have noticed that we've moved on to the second chapter of 2 Timothy. And although this book's a little bit different than 1 Timothy, so many of the concepts and themes are really just carrying through, so I'll just briefly mention some background comments before working through this chapter. For one thing, you probably already know that this is Paul's second letter to his friend and co-laborer named Timothy. Unlike his first letter to Timothy, this one was written from prison. And although the themes are similar, the tone here is much more in line with a man who doesn't expect to be released. In fact, in chapter 4, verses 6 to 8, it's pretty clear that Paul thinks he's going to die shortly, but he's ready, and he now wants to pass the torch on to Timothy. And so, this letter was written a handful of years after Paul wrote 1 Timothy. This was probably written around 66 to 67 AD. And unlike 1 Timothy, which focuses on how the church should be structured, this second letter focuses more on the nature and the character of personal pastoral ministry. And so as we read these chapters, we should have in mind the point that Paul is making. He's basically saying, Timothy, I'm not going to be around much longer, and this is what you need to know about your ministry so that both of us will successfully pass on the torch that's been entrusted to us. And so with that as some background, now let's move on to our study of 2 Timothy chapter 2. Chapter 2 opens in verse 1 saying, You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Now when it comes to faithful ministry, this right here is a major component. The principle of ministry strengthened by God's grace, it's foundational to everything else a pastor does. Now, the grace here is way more than just the theological concept of unmerited favor that we sometimes say grace is. Paul here is talking about the soul-filling, soul-reviving, soul-strengthening grace of God. Now, yesterday we talked about the challenges and the burdens of pastoral ministry. All of that's going to burn out a pastor in short order unless he is strong in the grace that's in Christ Jesus. And so this grace is the energias of Philippians 2.13 that enables us to will and to work for God's pleasure. This grace is the transforming and, and empowering strength that gave Paul the ability to be and do all that he did. We saw that back in 1 Corinthians 15.10. And unless a person or a pastor or a teacher is strong in this grace, their own human strength will quickly give out. And so how does a person become strong in the grace of Jesus? Well, by being about the things that strengthen this grace in our life and and avoiding the things that weaken it. And so the things that strengthen the grace of God in our life are things like long wrestling seasons of private prayer, uh, a mind filled with and believing and living in light of God's truth, true truth, uh, biblical fellowship with Christ followers, frequent times of public and private worship, uh, a life dedicated to serving and ministering to others, a life of daily dying to self, consistent obedience and persecution, Consistent, unconditional love towards others, living by the fruit of the Spirit. And again, all of this being wrapped in and bathed in prayer. These are the things that strengthen the grace of God in our life. Now, the things that hinder and thwart God's grace in our life are things like any sin or or any activity that quenches the Holy Spirit, any activity that is feeding our flesh, uh, embracing any belief that's not rooted in God's truth, worldly thinking, worldly pursuits, operating without faith, operating in our own strength, Pursuing things for self and not for Christ's kingdom, any hypocrisy, any fakery, or trying to appear more spiritual or more mature than you really are. These things and things like these things sap us of spiritual grace and strength to be faithful in our ministries. And so Paul's charge to Timothy and and Paul's charge to us is to pursue the things that strengthen God's grace in our life and avoid those things that weaken it. There's no silver bullet to the Christian life, but those who are strong in the grace of Christ are those who will cross the finish line victoriously, and they'll only get there by the grace of God empowering them. Well, moving on to this chapter here, the next key principle is in verse 2, where Paul tells Timothy, The things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these things to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. And so Timothy, and, and by extension all of us, are to take the truths that we have learned from Paul and be on the lookout for spiritually faithful people that we can teach these truths to with the clear and express purpose where even they understand that once they have learned these truths, 
They then have the responsibility to pass them on to the next generation. That's Christ's design for the church, and thankfully his faithful servants have been doing this all the way up to this day, and you and I have a part in that work in this world. Well, going on, the next set of verses reminds us of the principle that a faithful servant of God has a focus on Christ's kingdom and not the kingdom of this world. And so in verses 3 to 7, Paul uses the analogy of a soldier and an athlete and a farmer. In verse 4, a soldier doesn't get entangled in daily life because they're about victory and accomplishing the directives of his commander. In verse 5, an athlete is focused on the personal development necessary to abide by all the stipulations necessary for them to win the prize. In verse 6, The farmer does all of this labor, and and by the way, that word labor there implies difficulties and trouble in the work. He does it with the expectation that he will eventually share in the harvest. And so, by extension, Christ's faithful servants don't get entangled in this world. They keep the commands of Christ, and they look forward to enjoying the harvest that they're laboring for. That's their focus. Well, then in verses 8 to 10, we see that a faithful servant serves Jesus Christ and his people. Paul knows in verse 9 that even if he's in prison, the work of Christ will continue on. But Paul's service is not just to Christ, but also to Christ's people. And so in verse 10, Paul says, For this reason I endure all things for the sake of those who are chosen, so that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus, and with it eternal glory. And so the faithful minister needs to be about serving the chosen people of Jesus. They may not always understand this, or even really want it, But that is the work of the pastor. He is dedicated to serving them so that those whom Christ has chosen will obtain the salvation that is theirs in Christ. Then in verses 11 to 13, Paul gives Timothy a little memory device to pull all of this together. It's basically a little poem that says, It is a trustworthy statement, for if we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. In other words, those who have died to their old life will be raised to a new life. Those who are faithful will have an eternal role in Christ's kingdom. And those who reject these truths will be rejected as well. But in everything, God is faithful. Well, going on to verse 14. Verse 14 now brings us to a new topic, which is really returning to the reoccurring topic of the dangers of false teachers. And that just shows us how vigilant the church needs to be about false teaching. It is pervasive. And so Paul says in verse 14, Remind them of these things and solemnly charge them in the presence of God not to wrangle about words which is useless and leads to the ruin of the hearers. In other words, Timothy, keep solemnly, seriously reminding the people not to wrangle about words. There are lots of people who want to get caught up in the minutia of doctrine and beliefs and nitpicking and splitting hairs. Don't be like that. Uh, Paul even says in verses 16 and 17, But avoid worldly and empty chatter, for it will lead to further ungodliness, and their talk will spread like gangrene. It's common for people to get a little bit of training and think they're experts on an issue, and that their job is to critique everyone else who may not perfectly say what they think should be said in the way they think it should be said. They have that puffed-up view of themselves we saw back in 1 Corinthians 8, where they're really edifying no one, not even themselves, and they're actually corrupting the church like gangrene. And so Paul wants Timothy to tell this church, guys, quit wrangling over minutia. It's useless and will lead to the ruin of this fellowship. Now, having said that, though, the pastor teacher is supposed to have a solid hand on the word of God. And so the call to not bicker over minutia, it's not an excuse to ignore biblical accuracy. And so in verse 15, Paul says, Be diligent to present yourselves approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. Now, this idea of being diligent here, it means hard work, faithful work, dedicated work. It speaks to the attention to faithfulness and quality and accuracy. It often means long hours where we're still laboring in the word and prayer, even when most people might be shutting down for the night. Why do all this? Well, because the workman, the faithful servant, recognizes that he serves an awesome God of this universe and that he or she is the herald of God's message. And so they've got to labor in it to understand it because a slight misunderstanding on their part may introduce gangrenous falsehoods into the church. I see it all the time. People get this wrong belief in their head and they just won't let go of it. And so any teacher, whether a Sunday school teacher or a small group leader or a pastor or an evangelist, has to accurately handle the word of God. Our job is to herald the message of God he has given to us. It's not to entertain people or rework the word of God so it has some new relevancy for their life. 
Our job is to proclaim the words of this king so that his chosen people hear it and understand it and live in light of it. Now, as we continue on in this chapter, obviously this wasn't the case for Hymenaeus or Philetus in verses 7 to 18, who were causing all kinds of disruptions with their false teaching about the resurrection. Those guys weren't doing this, and so Paul was giving Timothy and really the whole church an example of how destructive this false teaching can be. And so, at times, the ministry of the faithful servant can be discouraging. It's often said that the church would rather be entertained with heresy than bored with the truth. And so, a teacher might be teaching accurate truth, but not seeing the dividends he'd hoped for. And so, Paul gives Timothy these words of encouragement. He says, Nevertheless, the firm foundation of God stands, having this seal. The Lord knows who are his. And so, Timothy, stand on this foundation and do not be moved from it. Teach God's word faithfully and accurately, knowing that God is not calling you to hold a pyramid of marbles together. He knows who are his, and our job is just to be faithful with the message. Now, as we go on here, looking at verse 19, the second half of verse 19 gives us a spiritual principle that links with what we've just been saying, but it also introduces Paul's next teaching on the pursuit of holiness. And so, the second half of verse 19 says, Everyone who names the name of the Lord is to abstain from wickedness. And so if a person is truly one of God's people, they are and they will abstain from wickedness. And then in verses 20 to 21, Paul uses the analogy of the kinds of things you might keep in your house. And there's some things we all have, and we're probably glad we have them, but we keep them, you know, like under the bathroom sink, deep in the back, only to be used when necessary. And then we also have other things that we delight in and we want everyone to see. We put them in this, this prominent place in the house. And so in verse 21, Paul is saying, if we want to be like that with God, as in having that place where we are useful and just part of God's present right work right now, then we've got to pursue the kind of sanctification that conforms to his holiness. Now, sanctification, another way of saying holification, like making something holy. And when we come to God as his child, we want to walk in fellowship with him. Well, he's going to want to holyify us so that our fellowship with him is just about his holiness and about his work. And so Paul exhorts Timothy in verse 22 saying, Now flee from youthful lusts and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. And so this is a similar principle about being strong in God's grace. That word lust there in verse 22, it's really just a word for an intense desire or craving. It could be an intense desire for anything. And so, giving ourselves over to the passions of our heart will not produce holiness. What produces holiness? It's a life of righteousness and faith and love and peace and fellowship with other people who are also pursuing Christ from a pure heart, where they are sincerely, truly wanting these things for themselves. A life dedicated to these principles will be a life increasingly useful to the Lord's work. Now, that's great stuff right there, but we're not done with this chapter, so let's quickly hit the last few verses here. In verse 23, Paul then tells Timothy to refuse foolish and ignorant speculations. We keep on seeing this reoccurring theme about just wrangling over words, false teaching. And we've mentioned in the past that there are people who get hung up on all kinds of speculations, like who are the sons of God in Genesis 6, or what is the nature of manna, or some other issue. But here's what we need to understand. Since the Holy Spirit has chosen to not give us that information, well, then his spirit and his grace won't be infusing all of that time and all of that effort we're investing in those speculations. And since we always want to be in fellowship with the Holy Spirit, then let's be about the things that his grace will fill instead of filling our minds and filling our lives with things he's chosen not to reveal and that he's really not even a part of. To further bolster this point, Paul then says in verses 24 to 26, The Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to all, able to teach, patient when wronged, with gentleness correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may grant them repentance leading to the knowledge of truth, and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. You see, God's servants need to have this mindset of compassion that often people who are wanting to bicker over minutiae or who are fascinated with speculations are often people who are held captive to Satan. And so quarreling and arguing with them isn't going to win them over to the truth. That's the work of God and his spirit and his word. And so patiently bring them back to the truth and hope and pray and trust that God might bring them to repentance because it has to come from him where they would then surrender to his truth. Well, that's 2 Timothy chapter 2, or chapter rich with wisdom for faithful servants. And as we round out our time together this morning, if you're serving the Lord as a teacher, how about praying that these principles will be true of you? And likewise, how about praying that these be true of the teachers in your church? 
And on that note, we're going to bring today's episode to a close. Thanks for listening. Hope you have a great rest of your day. And until tomorrow, God bless.